Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome to the Operator Framework Maintainer Track session here at KubeCon EU 2024. Uh, by way of introduction about who we are and why you should listen to us, uh, my name is Jonathan Burkhan. I'm a steering committee member for Operator Framework. I'm a maintainer for Operator SDK, probably some other things I'm forgetting. Uh, I'm an open source contributor who works for IBM. I've worked on Operator Framework. I've worked on Kubernetes. I've worked on Cloud Foundry back in the day, if you've ever heard of that. Uh, and I'm here to talk about Operator Framework with my friend Varsha. Um, I work as an engineer at Red Hat. I'm also a steering committee member. Uh, contributor to Operator SDK, a maintainer for SDK and OLM, um, maintainer of Kube Builder, and few other things uh, all around Kubernetes in general. So here we are to talk about Operator Framework. Uh, so show of hands, who knows anything on the slide? Who here has heard of operators? Hopefully that's most of you, otherwise I really don't know why you're here. Um, Operator Framework, Operator SDK, Java Operator SDK, OPM OLM, all of those are the various things that uh, Operator Framework uh, maintains. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about, focusing mainly on Operator SDK and Operator Lifecycle Manager, because those are sort of our, our two main big projects. Uh, so just in case, for those of you who didn't raise your hand when I asked if you knew what an operator was, let's go over that very briefly. Uh, so an operator is a, an architectural pattern for writing software that runs on top of Kubernetes. And the special thing about it is rather than creating a whole bunch of Kubernetes MAML myself that statically describes a bunch of stuff that runs in pods on Kubernetes, I am going to teach Kubernetes to fish by extending its API. Uh, so I'm going to write a whole bunch of complicated stuff, and the end result of that stuff is that the same way you can kubectl create pod, and that makes a pod, a container, come into existence somewhere in the back end, uh, I'm going to extend the API so I can kubectl create my thing, and that will make my thing come into existence somewhere in the back end. Uh, and then can that can be as complicated or as simplistic as I want to make it. It could be a whole bunch of pods come into existence and network together and talk to each other over services and connect to off-cluster resources and who knows what else. So that's really what the uh, idea of an operator is. Uh, and like I said, Operator Framework, we're a CNCF incubating project uh, that makes a variety of tools that make this process simpler, I promise. Uh, <laughs> Most above them are Operator SDK and OLM. Those are the big ones you're probably familiar with. We also make a couple other ones like OPM uh, for packaging operators, scorecard for testing operators, a couple other things like that. Uh, but today, specifically, what we're going to be talking about is the things that are new and exciting. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Operator SDK side of things, and then Varsha will be discussing the advancements that are going on in OLM. Uh, so on the Operator SDK side of things, uh, things have been sort of more or less stable. Uh, we've upgraded to the most recent version of Kube Builder, which means we've moved to V4 plugins, if you're familiar with how Kube Builder is internally architected. Um, so we've deprecated support for the old V3 stuff, uh, and this mostly is so we can keep using the most recent versions of Kubernetes itself and customize for crunching our YAML together. Uh, so this is just make sure we maintain compatibility with new versions of things moving forward. Uh, Java Operator SDK recently joined the project, and they are doing a lot of active development with uh, version 5.0 of their stuff. Um, and I believe, theoretically, they promised me, as of right now, today, uh, the snapshot release of that is available if you want to go try it. Um, but basically, this is just sort of an opportunity to implement a bunch of breaking changes that have sort of been piling up uh, over the past couple months. Uh, for more details, you can click on that link uh, and see some milestones. But let's briefly talk about some of the stuff they've done. So again, dependency bumps. Uh, they've moved on up to Java 17 and Fabricate 7.0, uh, just sort of keeping up with things. Uh, and then in terms of actual features, let's talk about some of the stuff they've got going on. Um, so they have been going through their stuff and changing things over where they can to use server-side apply, uh, particularly in handling updates to statuses and handling finalizers. Uh, so this is actually something that I don't think we're up to in the Golang side yet, is server-side apply, because that's going to change a lot of stuff on the back end. Um, so that's cool. Um, they've also introduced some finer grain control on how they handle reconciliation loops. Um, so you can check if the next reconciliation is imminent, sort of have some finer grain control over uh, how you return from your reconciliation loops there in the Java controller. 
Um, they've also improved their handling of dependent resources. So this is how, if you have a CRD, you can have dependent resources so that they're attached and Kubernetes knows that they belong to you. Um, they've done some improvements on how that's handling uh, with some notable uh, use cases that they don't currently support, uh, such as recreating external resources or support for read-only and bulk setup. Uh, so this is mainly dealing with stuff that handles off-cluster resources that are represented in the Kubernetes etcd but don't actually correspond to resources that exist on cluster. That's sort of still handled manually. Um, Oh, right. And they added support for optional dependent resources. So this is, say, I have my operator depends on some other CRD type or some other operator that may or may not exist on the system. And their sort of uh, example use case of this is routes, which is a thing specific to OpenShift. Uh, I can declare, you know, when you create an instance of my CR that go and make a route happen if and only if routes exist. Uh, so this is also sort of eases some of the dependency curmudgeonliness. So if I have an operator that depends on other operators, that can be hard to deploy and not have it explode if stuff doesn't there. Um, and this is just sort of a, a quality of life thing. Uh, so that's an example of that, uh, where I create a route if routes exist, otherwise I just make some ingress stuff. Uh, they did some improvements with workflows. So when I talk about workflows here, I mean uh, Java operator SDK workflows, not the Kubernetes workflow stuff that Google makes. Um, they've extracted this to their own separate annotations and supported some additional finer grain uh, control over that uh, so that they can be explicitly invoked from within your controller. And if you click through on those links in the presentation, you'll see some code examples of those. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Varsha to talk about OLM. So, Operator Lifecycle Manager. Uh, before getting into what's new with OLM, let's have a brief overview about what OLM is. Uh, I know many of you would be familiar with the benefits and with the troubles you're facing with OLM. So we are hoping that we could solve most of those and I'll be going through the changes we are planning to make. Uh, so I can imagine, the way I imagine OLM to be is you have an application, you have an operator which manages the life cycle of the application. But who manages the life cycle of the operator? And that's what OLM does. So operator lifecycle manager helps you manage the life cycle of an operator itself by providing a few benefits, like the whole concept of catalog management, taking care of upgrades by ensuring CRD upgrade safety rules, by providing an extensive testing framework, and also taking care of dependency resolution, which is kind of very common when you build application where you want operator A to be dependent on operator B, or it's again interdependent on some other different packages, so on and so forth. So what's new with OLM? We are trying to build a whole new architecture, learning from the mistakes we have uh, faced in the past, taking all the feedbacks that we have from the community. And we have a few other interesting news, and that's what I'll go over. So OLM is moving to a new set of APIs. Now, why new set of APIs? Why wasn't V0 just enough? So the reason, some of the reason why this was the case, because the existing APIs, if you are aware of the whole install plan and subscription model, it was too much. For anyone who is new to OLM, it was very difficult for folks to get onboarded for the new in the old architecture and get used to this concept of install plan, having look at the status of multiple objects, aggregating them, so on and so forth. So it was time for us to build a new architecture based on the needs of the community. And majorly OLM was designed when CRDs were in beta format. So a lot of things which we had in mind while initially designing OLM are not relevant, are not prevalent right now. So that's what we are evolving and learning from the changes which are being made in Kubernetes in general. So learnings from V0. Today, which is what OLM0 is designed, is it has multiple user-facing APIs. A very simple example, without going into the architecture, is you have install plan, which has the list of resources which are going to get installed on the cluster. You have a subscription where you subscribe to a particular package to get updates. And the operator author has to build a bundle in a particular opinionated format called registry v1. Now, what does future of OLM look like? We'll be moving farther away from all this 
to a single top level user facing API. That way, as a user, you want to install a particular package, which has been approved by your cluster admin. You go in, you create a single API, and it's a one click solution to get everything on cluster installed. The second major issue was few of the architectural decisions in V0 were partially imperative. So in V1, we want to bring in a whole GitOps friendly approach and a one click solution for everything. Uh, this also dwells into the third point, which is having continuous reconciliation and the concept of rollbacks. Because things sometimes break, they are unpredictable. And V0 had a lot of problems in terms of allowing users to roll back to a previous version. There were upgrade paths clearly defined, but rollback was always complicated. It's in general, but V1 is trying to find ways to solve it. The next one is V0 always let you upgrade to a latest version available in a channel. But then in V1, we are trying to bring in the whole concept of a great path where you can choose the path you want your users to take in. If you want folks to move from 4.3.1 version to probably 4.4.2 based on the changes you made on a stable channel, then it's up to you. You can create your own upgrade path rather than forcing, to, uh, forcing the users to upgrade to a particular version and then making the whole concept complicated more. Uh-uh. Okay. Uh, the most important one, which I want to get into in detail, is V0 had a very opinionated packaging format. And I'll, uh, there's another slide just uh, expanding that particular point. But if you're familiar with V0, we had this concept of registry V1 bundles, which had this particular API, called cluster service version. So any operator you wanted needed to be packaged in a particular specific OLM compatible format, no matter whether you had it in the form of Helm chart, whether you had it in the form of plain manifests and things like that. So there was a lot of uh, additional work which an operator author had to do to onboard their operator into an OLM V0 catalog. So that's something which we are trying to make it easier uh, with V1, we are trying to extend support in a way where no matter how you package your bundle, your operator, you just tell us what to install and OLM does it for you. So moving to V1, how the overall architecture would look like. So OLM V0 was monolithic. Everything was bundled into a very big chunk of code and it was difficult uh, for us to even predict what's going to happen. So with V1, we are trying to break things into a set of focused and scoped components. So we'll introduce these four components. The first one is a user facing API. This is where a user can go and mention that I want to install an Argo CD operator of this and this version. It'll be straightforward. It'll contain the details which OLM needs to get an operator installed on the cluster from a catalog. The second one is catalog D. So it's a package server, which would, it's basically a controller, which would be running on the cluster. And it will ensure that the operators present in the catalog are available on cluster so that users can go and install it. This uh, next one is DEPI. So we are working on a dependency resolver to make things easier because installing operators is not straightforward. You have complex operators where one thing is dependent on another. For example, you have an operator X probably dependent on a cert manager operator. So we need to make sure that the dependencies are resolved. That's a one click solution. If you are installing operator X, you also have all the dependencies in that tree installed and the user need not worry about making sure that nothing breaks. The third one is applier. And here we have an interesting news that we are also trying to make OLM compatible with KApp controller. So KApp controller is one of um, the sub projects of Carvel. Do check it out. It's also a CNCF open source project and it has a bunch of amazing features which uh, OLM could use and make sure that the contents are applied on the cluster. 
So currently, we have support for RuckPack, which is an inbuilt applier with present uh, in the repository. And we are also trying to work on integration with KApp Controller. So how does the overall process look like with respect to OLM? This is in terms of the user. So a user creates an API. And then there's catalog D running on cluster, which basically takes in the API. For example, the API could say, uh, the CR could say that I want to install package X from this particular catalog. Now what catalog D would give you is it would provide the contents of the catalog available on cluster, helping the user to choose the operator which they want to install. Then we have dependency resolution. So dependency resolution basically involves the process in which the uh, OLM would run a few set of pre-flight uh, pre checks to ensure that if operator X is being installed, does something break on the cluster or not? Uh, is it safe to install operator X? Is it safe to upgrade operator X? So dependency resolver would give us a signal telling yes or no, whether we can install it or not. Now, after OLM reads the signal, we currently use RuckPack to install it. And we have work going on with respect to KApp Controller, where we will create one of the API which KApp Controller provides, which is known as App API. It will create an App CR, and then things would be available on cluster because KApp Controller will also be running in the background. So how does the overall workflow look like in the new architecture? So operator author comes in. They create a bundle which is packaged in whatever format, whether it's registry B1, whether it's a set of plain manifests, so on and so forth. And they add it to a particular catalog. This is very similar to how V0 works right now. But then this catalog D, which is running on cluster, which takes in this catalog image, it unpacks it and makes sure that the individual packages are available on cluster for OLM to pick it up and install uh, as required. Now we have the next set, the next persona, which is the user. The user comes in, they create an API, not going into the names, but very generic because everything is still in progress. And the user facing API basically tells OLM that I want to, the user wants to install package X constrained to a particular version from this particular channel. So what does OLM do then? It takes in the available operators, packages available uh, from the catalog D. It runs dependency resolution, gives us a signal whether it's yes or no. If it's a no, it gives out an error telling you can't install package X because you already have some API on cluster, which is going to cause you conflicts, or it's going to say, hey, no package is available from the catalog that matches your requirements. After which we create an app CR. And here is when the K app controller kicks in, it reads in the contents of app CR, and it makes sure that the contents are applied on the cluster and the operator is available. So these are the three different personas where we have the persona of the OLM itself doing an action. We have the persona of the operator author where he may, uh, they make things easier uh, in terms of bundling and providing it on cluster into the catalog. And then we have KApp controller integration, which basically takes in and applies things on the cluster. So another interesting use case is um, Helm is all over the place. Helm is a very amazing package manager. So it's very common that users who build operators already have their operator packaged as a Helm chart. Now with V0, or in the current scenario, if a user wants to exploit the benefits of OLM, they would have to take in the Helm chart, convert it into a registry V1 uh, bundle, and then apply it on cluster. Now with OLM V1, we are working towards an approach where users will be able to install packages from a Helm chart directly and would at the same time get the benefits of OLM in terms of upgrade safety, dependency resolution, and things like that. The next part is the cluster extension controller. And this is the heart of OLM. So what we are working with the cluster extension controller is it is the engine which basically looks for the particular user-facing API. 
it reads in what the user provides, it calls in a dependency resolver, it brings in contents from catalog D for the dependency resolution, it kicks in, it makes sure that app CR is created or any other API is created and the applier does its job by applying contents into the cluster and it helps to read the status of the particular um, whatever the applier has done, the action that applier has taken and bring it back to the user. So this is the heart of the cluster extension controller or the extension controller which we are working on. So yeah, those were the updates about OLM v1 in general. So please uh, do let us know how do you feel about the new architecture, if there are any changes you would like to see in and things like that. We are very active upstream. We have a Slack channel called OLM Dev for OLM and for SDK we have Operator SDK Dev. So uh, we welcome the community contributions because this V1 architecture is basically based on the feedback that community has provided to us. Any questions? Uh, so we'll be taking questions now and uh, show of hands. Uh, I'm gonna be running around with the microphone and please ask the question into the microphone so it's on the recording. All the way in the back here. Excuse me, thank you for your talk and thank you for the, the development. I was wondering if you have uh, elements to do rollback, you know, when you upgrade your operator and you want to go back to the previous version of the operator. Did, uh, is it the uh, thing in your version? Uh, so with OLM, we have still not figured out the uh, rollback feature yet. But the whole concept which we are thinking into is we have this cluster extension controller or the OLM controller that kicks in, uh, make sure that the downgrade is also safe by doing a set of pre-flight checks and kind of brings, uh, rollbacks the operator back to the previous version. So this feature is not in yet, but we have discussions and design documents around that still. Uh, also know that the messiest part of doing something like that is probably going to be writing the conversion <laughs> webhook. Okay, just so you're aware. Uh, anyone else? You could also use this opportunity to talk about what you all don't like in OLM v0. Hi. Um, we are running uh, the controller framework in, uh, in a large-scale scenario, and we have quite a few resources, and I was wondering if something like sharding is uh, planned or anything that you consider or look into, um, because even if reconciliation takes a longer time, uh, you want to do that in parallel and maybe on multiple resources at the same time. I'm not quite a follow. When you say sharding, do you mean like sharding, like having multiple controllers that are responsible for reconciling different portions of a single resource? Okay, wanted to keep things simple. Um, I mean, the short answer is no, I'm not aware of any attempts we have to implement something like that right now, especially because that would necessitate like changes on the Kubernetes side of things. Like how do you generate a watcher that only watches a certain part of the etcd for a single resource? And, and we don't control that because we, we live in Kubernetes land and Kubernetes does stuff and we use it. Um, that said, if I really wanted to do that, how would I do it? Um, you could probably do something with namespaces where like the individual resources are namespace scoped and you have multiple controllers that watch only things like that. Now, I can imagine all kinds of horrible ways that would blow up, but... The uh, <laughs> other uh, general principle is not let multiple controllers handle the same resource. Uh, we have SSA which takes care of making sure that only particular part of the spec is handled by a particular owner, but still uh, you would not. Isn't, isn't there another way you can do a filter on the cache and then have each controller ha have a different cache so it doesn't actually know about the other resources, it only receives the updates implicitly for the ones that you're filtering on? I Don't ever do that. <laughs> For a single distance. <laughs> uh, okay, do we have any other questions? Oh, 
Okay. Well, if not, thank you all for coming. Varsh and I will be around to talk if you want to chat about anything about operators. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.